Warning, this is the last chance to run up our profanity score for 2020. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Dog Terrifying PTSD Inducers. Dog Terrifying PTSD Inducers. Because you could just watch fireworks on your fucking TV and they'd be way better than the shit you could afford anyway, but then I wouldn't know how hard to go fuck myself. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hi, this is Jay, an undergraduate student studying biology here in Washington State. And I'm here to assure you that we did, in fact, evolve from filthy monkey men. Also, we're all African apes, so cut it out with that racism bullshit. Thursday. It's December 31st. And it's the last time we'll be able to blame this show on 2020. <laughs> no, it's not. No. <laughs> I have no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Bill O'Reilly's New Jersey, <laughs> Cincinnati Red State and Redtown Blue State, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, churches PPP themselves and make us clean, clean, clean it up. Matt Powell debunks the duck-billed dinosaur surfing wing of evolution. <laughs> <laughs> and 2020 will fuck off and die. <laughs> yeah, it will. But first, the die try. I know how weird this is to say, but I'm hesitant to say that this is the last day of 2020. I mean, I know it, it is, and nothing that I'm going to say is going to change that. But the way this year is going, I feel like there's like a 10% chance that scientists are going to discover some previously unknown double leap year shit or something. And we're going to end up with a December 32nd just because that's how hard we can fuck ourselves this year. Right? I, okay, that seems impossible. But imagine that like somebody in Trump's inner circle just came up with this calendric Miss Havisham scheme where we just keep adding days to December so we never really reach Biden's inauguration. Given what 2020 has taught us about this world, how confident can we possibly be that that isn't going to happen? I mean, look, we, we, we have a bit of a habit of trying to assign personalities to years. You remember back in 2016 when everybody made a big deal about how many celebrities died that year, but then you... Go back and you look at the numbers and it was just a perfectly average number of celebrity deaths in 2016. It just happened that early in the year we got it in our collective heads that this was the dead celebrity year and it became a meme. And, you know, it's just like when you learn a new word and suddenly you encounter it everywhere. And it's not that it got more common, it's that you got more aware of it. And to some extent, that actually is what happened in 2020, right? I mean, a lot of people are doing the big breathless lists to summarize 2020 and they're including all the shit like wildfires and floods and murder hornets. But like... That's just the shit that happens in years. right? I'm, I'm not trying to downplay natural disasters, of course. They're terrible, but every year has them. As terrible as they are, they don't distinguish 2020 from any other year. So the, the idea that this year has just been one thing after another after another is true because that's how time works, right? At a certain point, I mean, we made a meme out of adding this list of shit that went wrong together. So it seems like it's a really long list. But that perception actually threatens to camouflage what actually went wrong with this year. So to be clear, 2020 was a historically terrible time to be alive. But it was because of two things, not some comedically bloated list. The first, obviously, is the pandemic. And the second, just as obviously, is Trump's malevolent form of anti-leadership. You know, he, he got worse every year of his presidency and thus every year was the worst year of his term. And when you couple that with the abnormally high stakes because of the first thing, you get the year that your grandkids will get sick of hearing you bitch about. And as tempting as it is to use this moment to bid it an unceremonious get the fuck out, I think it's more important than ever that we remind ourselves that New Year's Day is just an arbitrary spot on the calendar. I mean, it doesn't even have astronomical significance. I mean, I have no doubt that 2021 will be a better year. We have, we have multiple vaccines now. Trump is out of office in a few weeks. Breath of the Wild 2 is supposed to come out. All solid advances. But there are also a lot of things about 2020 that cannot be undone. 
I mean, the most obvious, of course, are the deaths. Over a third of a million people just in the U.S., very nearly two million people worldwide. And let's be clear, the real numbers are almost certainly way higher than that. But we lost a lot more than lives this year. We also forever lost that comforting illusion that deep down, most of us are good people. We're not. I mean, maybe a bare majority of us are, but even that's suspect at this point. What we know for sure is that way more people in this country are morally bankrupt than we were ever willing to admit before. I mean, it, we we knew we were stupid, right? Like even the most patriotic homer in America had to admit that we were dumber than most countries. And, and that's how we explained Trump away in 2016. We convinced ourselves that we were just too stupid to see what he was and what he was going to do. But we couldn't use that excuse again in 2020. I mean, sure, Biden won, but his margin was nowhere near decisive enough to redeem us from the righteous judgment of history. And we can throw away this year's calendar or <laughs> beat it up with baseball bats and set it on fire, whatever you have to do. But we're never going to rid ourselves of the knowledge that more than a third of this country would burn it all down over their God-given right to hate gay people. You know, ultimately, when we look back on 2020 as a society, we'll probably try to blur that part out as much as we can. We're, we're going to dwell on the feel good stories about communities coming together and medical workers persevering and normal people coping online. And we'll dutifully focus on all the people who died, but we won't focus on the people who killed them. We'll, we'll pretend that the anti-mask conspiracists were some tiny sliver of aberration rather than stuff like, you know, the entire town I live in. I mean, maybe when you and I are gone, historians will start being honest about this, but mostly we're going to avoid those uncomfortable facts so that we can get back to lying to ourselves about how our neighbors are good deep down. And of course, when I say we, I mean they. I am not talking about us. Because while everybody else tries to reduce this past year to cultural symbols like people wearing masks, you and I are going to remember it as a year when a lot of people took their masks off. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the adios and adieu to my Alf Weider Zane, Heath Enright, and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to bid this year a firm fuck off? Fuck your face, 2020. <laughs> Damn right I am going to lower a Joe Biden vaccine into my eyeball at the stroke of midnight, Noah. This <laughs> <laughs> is God intended. Yeah, I heard fuck your face, and he's really committing to the Yeah, there you go. It's dedication. All right. In our lead story tonight, we have a story about Matthew Tiberius Powell. <laughs> Get the fuck excited. This 25-year-old tween makes me so goddamn happy. So normally we have to sift through these horrible headlines every week. The vaccine ate my eyeball. Pastor fucks child. Yells ethnic slur. Gets mm -hmm. hit in the face with a can twisted tea. Amy Coney Barrett didn't die again. But every once in a while, every once in a while, the next headline after those is Matt Powell explaining <laughs> that evolution is wrong because there were not surfing monkeys 34 million years ago. Yep. And that's exactly what happened this week. <laughs> yep. Here at The Scathing Atheist, we look forward to Matty P releases like they're a Marvel premiere. You know, we, we line up outside of YouTube dressed like him. It's a blast. We have a lot yeah. of fun. No, I'm going to dress like a surfing monkey for the next one. But yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> Called it. Yep. So Matt Powell made another video. It's called Noah's Flood versus Primitive Superstition. What? Which is... Not how the word versus works. <laughs> no, not a great no. start. And he's out in the snow in this sad little field of scrubland near his mom's basement where he lives, wearing an all black suit. Like he's at a funeral for suburban sprawl or something. He just came from there. He's ridiculous. He looks like Slender Boy, the origin story for Slender Man. <laughs> or like or like Slender Man's rejected sidekick just so that he never becomes <laughs> badass. <you know? laughs> and he's sitting on a stool that he very clearly flipped backwards for no reason. <laughs> oh. Because, you know, that's nothing when it's a stool. There's no backwards that mm -hmm. way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he starts by saying, I made this video to school all those theistic evolutionists out there in the silliest possible way to sit on a stool <laughs> drops the mic walks away <laughs> yeah so according to maddie p 
Here's the problem with evolution. Quote, We've already verified and proven that evolution is nothing more than a fairy tale. Uh, and this, is, this is where he literally waves his hand yes. to accomplish that. <laughs> he, does. he does. These are not the evolutions you're looking for. <laughs> Continuing. In order for evolution to be true, monkeys would have had to surf from Africa to South America 34 million years ago on rafts. The only way that monkeys could have got there since they found monkey fossils there that weren't supposed to be there. Pause to remember how if then works as a concept. <laughs> Continuing. Wave your hands again. Wave your hands again. It helps. <laughs> Wave it back for the if then. <laughs> he got really confused with if then here. But he continued. According to evolution, because monkeys were in Africa, the only way they could have got there, according to evolution theory, was surfing the ocean blue. End quote. Okay. One amazing, weird use of poetic language there at the end. The ocean blue. Yeah, that was very strange. He repeated it. Two, this is fucking amazing because I think this is based on Noah's Ark. Yeah. Right? So he's That's what he he's thinks. debunking evolution because where did monkeys on Noah's Ark go? <laughs> yep. And his answer, by the way, is before you say it, monkeys can't surf. Okay, but, <laughs> so, okay, but here, here's the thing. To be clear. That is how monkeys got to South America. Okay, I mean, they didn't fucking surf, obviously, but they got there on these big ass vegetation rafts, which exist. You know, as far fetched as that sounds, that it's not, you know, your thing is 900 year old guy made a fucking big <laughs> boat with magic. <laughs> We've seen these rafts. They're large enough to hold a breeding population of shit. I'm sorry. I, like, I'm sorry. Did you have some other explanation for these 34 million year old fossils you just admitted existed? Maybe the fossils surf. <laughs> what? Yeah. Well, from there, he gives, well, the exact same speech again. Yeah. But it's about <laughs> duck billed dinosaurs. Why did the time. turkey cross the road? <laughs> <laughs> so in case he wasn't clear the first time, he explains how it would also be ridiculous to claim that duck billed dinosaurs could surf to Africa across the ocean. And then he accidentally tells the truth about Christianity. He does. According to Slender Boy, quote, if you're still going to believe in evolution, but say, no, the surfing monkeys and the surfing dinosaurs is ridiculous, that's like being a Christian and claiming not to believe the resurrection. The resurrection is part of Christianity, just as surfing monkeys and surfing dinosaurs is a part of evolution theory. Without it, evolution doesn't work. Without the resurrection, Christianity doesn't work. End quote. I mean... He gets there. I don't like the path, but he does get there. <laughs> I'm like, dude, your guy walks on water. Why would you bring up unrealistic water crossings as a subject, man? Just stay away from water stuff, man. It's not. It's never good for you. The monkeys didn't even turn it into wine along the way. <laughs> or did they? So the entire video is six minutes and 42 seconds. And it's delightful for so many reasons. He's trying so fucking hard, but it goes so badly. At one point, he literally says, the dictionary defines the word faith as, and he actually gives us the dictionary <laughs> definition of the word faith. But the absolute best part is watching Matt Powell get increasingly way too fucking cold and try to rush. <laughs> yes, line. yes. But <laughs> the added pressure of trying to plow through it makes him fuck up his lines even more <laughs> than normal. So the last few minutes of this thing have an edit about once every 10 seconds. And he's a little bit angrier and more panicked by the cold <laughs> each time he comes back in after the edit. It's the best. Yeah, it's always weird to end your sermon with, done, fuck, can I have cocoa with marshmallows now, mom? <laughs> <laughs> and in putting the greed in egregious news tonight. Pastor Mike McClure of the Calvary Baptist Church in San Jose, California, is apparently furious that he got left out of my new book, Outbreak, A Crisis of Faith, How Religion Ruined Our Global <laughs> Pandemic, and will be damned to hell if he's going to miss the sequel. His strong bid to be its antagonist came into view last week when we learned that his church, which has been fined over a million goddamn dollars for holding maskless, undistant services throughout the entire goddamn pandemic in open defiance of both local health departments and state regulations, also received over a third of a million dollars in PPP loans. Yeah, I'm, I'm 
just disappointed I paid someone to commit murder and they didn't send me a toe as proof that the job was done. You know, it's just. Yeah, Tara Reid's not happy. But if they sincerely <laughs> hold her toe, she has to give it up. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's not fair, but, you know, who's the fucking nihilist around here? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so quick reminder in case the people on Facebook are as stupid for you as they are for me. The very fact that churches are getting government subsidies to pay their employees is a despicable violation of church-state separation that directly conflicts with all the exemptions they claim to shit like, you know, taxes and anti-discrimination laws. So all by itself, that should be plenty to piss you off. But in this asshole's case, the church never even shut down. Right, The whole point of the PPP, that's the Paycheck Protection Program, was to give businesses that had to close down money so that they could retain their employees. So as much as it pains me to admit our Supreme Court has made distinct categories out of these two, it's entirely possible that this offense is both unconstitutional and against the law. Uh, Noah, while you were saying that, the Supreme Court just ruled that circle, circle, dot, dot was the law, but now it's not. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Rhymes. Love Supreme Court decisions that rhyme. It's important. <laughs> now, there's been a remarkable forgiveness on the part of the federal government when it comes to bilking these funds. Like an insane number of businesses and individuals that receive money under false pretenses have been allowed to go like, oh, my bad. And then just give it back as though they just got caught trying to sneak one of the cupcakes before the party. And the only reason I'm not certain that we're going to see the same thing happen here is I'm kind of doubt this asshole's going to give back the money. Yeah. And in shot in the armor of God news, right wing pastor and owner of evolution's officially laziest made ears, Robert Jeffress, <laughs> couldn't end the year without spiking our blood pressure one last time. Namely, by claiming credit for the life saving vaccine that has finally arrived, calling it, quote, a Christmas present from God. Who could have predicted? Huh. Hey, wasn't the president saying something about like injecting bleach in coal or something? <laughs> I forget what he said. Uh, it's just God sitting next to the tree all unappreciated and harumph. He's like, I don't know why you're making such a big deal about it. I also got you the antidote. So <laughs> <laughs> that was me. I did it's mine. I called it. it was me. <laughs> Fuck you. God signed the card on what mom got. <laughs> <laughs> So regular listeners to the show will remember Jeffress for calling COVID, quote, background noise three months ago. Well, just like the sound machine that keeps my baby asleep, it turns out that background noise is really, really fucking important, which means it was time for Jeffress to switch gears and take credit, saying, quote, for the past 10 months, millions of Americans have been praying to God, asking for relief from this pandemic. And I believe God has answered that prayer through these vaccines. I'm calling these vaccines an early Christmas present from God, and it shouldn't surprise us that God would use science to bring healing into our world. Jesus. Okay. It's not that fucking early of a Christmas present. It's pretty late <laughs> compared to the beginning of the thing. Maybe pray for world-saving medicine to be a little faster next time. Yeah. I don't know if praying is your thing. Yeah. It's weird for you to put a long fuse on that. Why would you do that? Especially since it, like, it happened before last Christmas. That's when the disease started. Yeah. <laughs> 19 uh, it's COVID God yeah it. that's right well I love that because based on the speed it's either really really fast for science or way too slow for God right. <laughs> and if what Jeffress says sounds like convenient bullshit made up in a desperate attempt to cape for God's failure don't worry Jeffress has you covered because sometimes scientists believe in God what checkmate us. <laughs> Quote, What's happening? I mean, after all, in the past, people like Isaac Newton and Blaise Pascal and Louis Pasteur were not just men of science, but men of faith who believed God <laughs> created this world in an orderly way that could be studied and benefited from. End quote. And, and I'm also I'm sure there was also a scientist that lived in a century that's next to the one that we live in on the timeline who believed my shit too. I just can't come up with any names as all. Yeah. And thanks to Isaac Newton's very solemn prayer, the derivative of X squared is 2X and we're welcome. So that's good. And one last reminder, Jeffress isn't just unfairly claiming credit for the solution. He's part of the problem. Let's not forget that he hosted a literal super spreader event yes. in his church in June and has been encouraging other churches to 
unsafely reopened since the very beginning of the pandemic. So, yeah, Robert Jeffress really Eiffel towering this problem from both ends. <laughs> And on that note, we're going to pause for a moment and hand things over to my lovely wife, Lucinda. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she was. If it's a legitimate rape. It makes you a slut, right? Hey, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Misogyny. If you've never heard of Ravi Zacharias, I totally forgive you. He was an incredibly insignificant person. But if your husband suckers you into reading bullshit Christian books, you'll know the name. For decades, he was one of the leading authors in the world of Christian apologetics. And he was well known enough that when he died in May, top-ranking U.S. evangelical Mike Pence spoke at his funeral. And then about six minutes after he was interred, the sexual assault allegations started rolling in. See, in addition to his ministry, Zacharias owned a couple of health spas in Georgia. And according to multiple former employees, he had been, quote, sexually out of control with the female therapist over whom he had professional power, end quote. An investigative report in Christianity Today is a little more explicit. They had three women on record that say he, quote, touched them inappropriately, exposed himself, and masturbated during regular treatment, end quote. This went on for years. Now, to their credit, when these allegations surfaced, the ministry did hire a law firm to conduct an outside investigation and have been open about the findings so far. But how low is the fucking bar before that's even worth mentioning? They didn't lie to cover up the crimes of a dead man, and at this point, that's more than we can expect from a ministry. And the whole thing is yet another reminder that the louder a Christian proclaims their moral authority, the more immoral they turn out to have been the entire time. That kind of hypocrisy springboards me into our next story pretty nicely. And that's the most recent press release from Operation Rescue. Quick refresher, they're the Kansas anti-abortion group most directly associated with the 2009 assassination of Dr. George Tiller. After years of disseminating manufactured propaganda against him, he was eventually killed by an Operations Rescue supporter that had donated thousands of dollars to the group and got information about Dr. Tiller's whereabouts from their senior policy advisor. Now, you'd think that a group that inspired murder like that would have already reached peak hypocrisy when it came to calling themselves pro-life. But every year, the group gives out what they call the Malachi Award for service to the pro-life movement. Well, this year, they decided that the person that best exemplified the pro-life stance was none other than Donald fucking Trump, the man responsible for the most American deaths since the guy who invented gunpowder. It's funny. Originally, I thought about doing a misogyny year in review thing for the segment, but then I saw that story and I was like, how could any summary encapsulate 2020 better than a story about an anti-abortion group patting Donald Trump for, quote, building a culture of life, end quote. And on that note, I'll hand things back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. And in Knots and Squares news. As the pandemic rages its way across our nation, decimating the population and medical structure of parts of the country that believed it would go untouched by COVID-19, many of the governors responsible for the early opening of states and therefore the deaths of thousands have had to take a good hard look at themselves in the mirror this week and declare a day of prayer. Yep. Great. So, okay, just a thought. If remote God magic works... Maybe just, uh, I don't know, stop going to church in person and spreading the fucking plague that you're yeah. praying about now. There you go. There you go. And hey, the correct response in the event that remote God magic doesn't work is the same one. Yeah, <laughs> so. either way I do that. Win, win, <laughs> win, win. Yeah, that's right. Instead of the badly needed lockdowns that will save countless lives, several governors who have been part of the problem from the very start have issued proclamations asking their constituents to think real hard and solve COVID. Yep. Because if there's one thing these governors are bad at, it's thinking. Yeah. Yeah. They, they always say thoughts and prayers, and I'm always thinking it's one or the other, dude. One or <laughs> you the gotta other. pick. <laughs> yeah. So first up comes Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves, who looks like they're coming out with a new line of commercials about a Mac, a PC, and a computer filled with child porn. <laughs> he declared a <laughs> statewide day of prayer, humility, and fasting, saying, quote, we know that there is power in prayer. In fact, it is what God commands us to do. As we have done throughout the history of this country, we will go to the Lord and ask for his protective hand over us, end quote. 
Uh, also, uh, let's also pray for God to tell my face that I'm not a baby who's proud about shitting just now. That would be great. So I can talk about real things without looking like an insane person like I always do. <laughs> And last, and certainly least as a human being, Nebraska Governor Pete Ricketts, who rejected the idea of mask mandates because they, quote, create resistance, end quote. What? To the has virus? Pro yep. Has like, probably Like physical resistance? Like you can't, he puts them on in a way that he can't breathe at some so, point? So unclear. But he's probably fucked his state the hardest. So he declared his day of prayer in the fanciest, most capital letters. <laughs> so God would see him first. Yeah. Uh -huh. So this proclamation, and you should check the link in the show notes because there's a picture of it and it's fucking nuts. It's all decked out to look like a medieval page of the Bible with, I kid you not, monastically gold embroidered corn at the corners. Yes. <laughs> so weird. Yeah. I'm pretty sure we're all invited to a bar mitzvah for a scarecrow. <laughs> Something like that. So, yeah, for those of you keeping score as the vaccine sweeps the country, protecting frontline healthcare workers and people most vulnerable to the illness, the score is still something science negative, a whole fucking bunch religion. Yep. And if you need specifics on that, check out Outbreak, a crisis of faith, how religion ruined our global pandemic now on Amazon. And finally tonight, in Spit Happens news, <laughs> I got to spit in Jesus' face. <laughs> and, and look, look, when it comes to aspirations, there are some things that go on your bucket list. There are some things that go on your vision board. And there are some things that you don't even dare to dream about. And this was in the latter category. I figured, you know, dead for centuries, if he ever existed at all. Time travel isn't logically possible. Even if it was, I'm pretty sure somebody wouldn't let me do that. And I left it at that. But somehow... <laughs> I managed it still, and if it hadn't been for Christian radio host and COVID surviving COVID denier E.W. Jackson, I might not even have realized it. But luckily for me, he said that Georgia voters who cast their ballots for Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff in the upcoming Senate runoff, quote, might as well spit in Jesus's face because Warnock and Ossoff have both done that, end quote. Okay, I'm pretty sure that was Ossoff's great, great, great grandpa or something. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know which of the Jews did what. Yeah, but, but in fairness, that great, great grandpa was blind and Jesus spat in his face and said, you're welcome. And grandpa was, you know, still blind because that's nothing. So he just spat. <laughs> yeah, back. Right, get right, right. Exactly. Jesus didn't have a big problem with spitting in people's faces, as I recall. I think his thing. So, yeah, after a long lamentation about how both of them are pro-abortion and advocates for LGBTQ rights, he points out that those are foolish positions. And since Psalm 14 tells us that the fool says in his heart that there is no God, that must mean that Warnock and Ossoff don't believe in God, <laughs> despite half of them being a pastor. And, and, and while your head is trying to reverse engineer his logic on that, he adds, quote, if you vote for them, you might as well vote against God, end quote. So. I, on the off chance that you're a registered voter in Georgia and you were still on the fence about finding a stamp, you got that going for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but now, based on what we know from this year's election, if God were on the ballot, 40% of this country would be like, yes, he did turn a lady to salt, but Hunter Biden had a computer, y'all. A computer. <laughs> Please interview me in a major news publication to search for my humanity. <laughs> Not there. Not there. No. <laughs> hey, Tucker. So, of course, E.W. wasn't the only bloviating Baptist bigot bemoaning the upcoming election. A Christian evangelist and man who managed to sully a name known for outing a Teletubby Franklin Graham <laughs> took time off of being an escaped sentient prototype of the mashed spinoff of Hasbro's Mr. Potato headline to write a lengthy <laughs> Facebook <laughs> lament about the nation's future should the Democrats take control of the Senate. <laughs> he looks like God decided to try one cube-shaped human. Yeah, right. right? Just, to shot, just to spice things up. He was like, I'll do one as I've a I've been cube. shaping them all the same, more or less. <laughs> all right, you know what? That, the cube thing, not great. Mr. Mashed Potato Head, not quite right. I'm thinking... <laughs> uh, loaded Mashed Potato Head? I don't know. <laughs> yes. So... Dust? Yeah. Loaded with dust? <laughs> so I'm going to load them with dust. 
I'm the God of the universe. All right. So Franklin Graham's chief concern centers around the Equality Act, which would add sexual orientation and gender identity to the list of protected classes under the Civil Rights Act. And he described the act, which literally does nothing but add LGBTQ people to a list of rights havers that already includes religious people as, quote, anything but equal and a, quote, attempt to rid our country of religious freedom protections, end quote. I mean, to be fair, at this point, our country's religious freedom protections are freedom from all the laws. So, yes, maybe. Yeah, He's right. a cube. You're a cube. <laughs> <laughs> if Time Cube was a person. There, there you is. go. That's it. It's, it. Yep. it's Franklin Graham. <laughs> yep. Nailed it. We all found right. it. So, yeah, for the record, that's the kind of disinformation Republican boosters are spreading in Georgia right now. That and three to seven daily mailers about what a radical socialist Warnock is and how Jewish Ossoff is. On a related note, the Democratic campaigns are still looking for online volunteers to phone bank in the you know, thus proverbially hockaloogie at the Lord. So if you have time or money for that matter, be sure to check out the show notes for more details. And with that important reminder, we're going to wrap up the headlines for the night. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Jumanji! And when we come back, we'll keep ignoring our mom's collective advice about what to do when you don't have anything nice to say. Well, if there's one thing that the end of 2020 tells us, it's that we really need to finish up the 2019 Vulgarity for Charity Roasts. So in the interest of chipping away that much more, gentlemen, are you ready to insult? Podcasting. <laughs> <You're> podcasting. <laughs> Good job. And you're over-reliant on the dash in your writing. How dare you? Fuck you! <laughs> I did a control F. I have no dashes punctuationless asshole. <laughs> all right, so let's open up with a roast of Texas Governor Greg Abbott for David. Oof. All right, Greg Abbott has two very different, equally horrifying looks. Look one, cheapest George W. Bush impersonator you could find on Thumbtack. <laughs> Look two, the lawyer slip and slide hired to defend them off the side <laughs> of a bus. <laughs> both different, both terrible. <laughs> And Noah Addison would like a roast for the Chuck Tingle masterpiece, Pounded in the Butt by My Book, Pounded in the Butt by My Book, Pounded in the Butt by My Book, okay. Pounded in the Butt by My Book, Pounded in the Butt by My Own Butt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Clever. N normally, I would be hesitant to roast a book I hadn't read, but since the other option would be to read that book, I'm going to live with it in this case. It's <laughs> tough for me, though. <laughs> it's tough. I admire Chuck Tingle's continued commitment to that single joke. <laughs> You know, Heath and Eli, I mean, we, we come out with new jokes every week, like a bunch of assholes over here where Chuck is just still squeezing a little more blood from that same stone. It'd be fucking impressive, if, even if the joke had been funny to start with. Yeah. All right. <laughs> He's squeezing blood from his own butt. <laughs> so, there you go. See, that's so much easier See? than what we do. All it's right. A new joke I did. Heath is yep. tough jingle. <laughs> Heath. I got one for you here. Tyson would like a roast for union tradesmen who are also libertarian. Is that Oh my thing? God, fuck your faces. <laughs> <laughs> hey, union tradesmen who are also libertarian. Um, No, you're not. Nope. <laughs> you're not. You're just stupid. You think you're Jack Reacher just living off the grid. No, you're not. First of all, Jack Reacher got a military pension from the U.S. government funded by tax dollars. And he got those checks in the mail from the Postal Service, funded by tax dollars. And the Postal Service was using roads, mm -hmm. funded by tax dollars. And you know how your house didn't get taken by Canadian warlords with muskets <laughs> yesterday? It's not because of your better musket skills. It's because of the police and the military, centrally planned and, again, funded by tax dollars. Taxation is lack of theft, you fucking idiots. Well done. <laughs> well done. All right. So, Eli, Melissa would like a roast of Mitch McConnell. And I'm guessing now more than ever. <laughs> yeah, boy. Mitch McConnell sucks so much. The only reason not to go back in time and kill baby Hitler is that baby Mitch McConnell would use less time gas. <laughs> <laughs> also, <laughs> we all stopped talking about this and I don't know why. He very clearly got bit by a zombie a few months ago and is hoping he can get away with it by putting brains to a floor vote. <laughs> oh, sorry, this just in. It passed because Wisconsin yep. counts as much as California. So, right. yes. Yeah, um, Brains is law, everybody. I don't yep. know what that means, yep. but brains. <laughs> <laughs> and Heath, Betty would like you to insult the absolute shit out of cancer. 
Oh, good one. Okay. Well, cancer, it's kind of like Republicans moving into your town. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you try to do regular checkups to stay ahead of it. <laughs> you catch it early. You can just like cut around the meat and remove them. But, but if they start spreading, you have to poison them with chemicals oh, or shoot them with lasers and gamma rays. And sometimes that works, but then they show up again years later out of nowhere. And they hide sometimes like black mold and they fuck up the value of the property. But <laughs> every year we do get a little bit closer to a cure. So that's good. According to the latest science, it comes from your mom and dad more than anything else. The cancer, <laughs> so it's kind of hard to get rid of. I'm not saying eugenics is good, but for this one thing, Steve. I'm not saying it's good. But I'm listening to the pitch. I'm listening. <laughs> you, I'll hear you out. Maybe prima nocta. No, it's okay. Uh, we're right. just talking here. We're just talking. We're just shooting the we, shit. We don't have to be. We're just brainstorming. Even doing that. Ways to cure republicanism. <laughs> I don't know. Ends means Machiavelli. Okay, Noah, you're up next. <laughs> Chad would like a roast of his brother, Trevor. Yeah, so apparently Trevor was a uh, youth pastor whose honesty and integrity got in the way, so he became an atheist whose kindness and acceptance is the reason that Chad was able to get through one of the hardest parts of his life and also gives Neckbeard a bad name. Like, Chad sent us this <laughs> heartfelt message about what a great guy he was, and I was like, oh, this is going to be hard, and then I saw the picture where he's got this expression that can only be described as trying to convince Chris Hansen that he was there to check the meters. So I was like, all right, that's much easier now. <laughs> All right, Eli, you're up again. Uh, James would like a roast of the art of belly dancing. Thank you, James. Finally, finally, we can be honest about the most confusing of sexy dances. Interesting. For if stripping is Charizard and burlesque is Charmillion, then belly dancing is definitely Charmander. What? But here's the thing. At its absolute highest level... It looks like Quato is about to burst out of you, right? It doesn't feel <laughs> good. It feels like Quato is going to burst out of you, and then Quato is going to tell me that my boner is cultural appropriation. Yeah. There's a lot going on there. I don't like it. Don't like it. I'm saying I like it. Mm. <laughs> and Heath, I got one here for you. John would like a roast of his boss, Brian. <laughs> okay. Cool, we got a picture. I always wondered what happened to Alfred E. Newman, so now we know. <laughs> Apparently, he became John's boss. He looks like a super cooperative character at the beginning of an SVU episode. <laughs> <laughs> and he is definitely 100% the reason the HR department has a form letter about non-consensual fist bumps. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm, I'm going to take this request from Steve for his friends, uh, Paul and Kelsey. And this was a weird one because Steve says, like, I want you to roast my friends, Paul and Kelsey. So, I, you know, I set my insult meter to jovial ribbing. And then I start reading the description and Paul and Kelsey are the worst goddamn people you can imagine. <laughs> right. And Steve doesn't shy away from this. They're like they're pretentious, petty, Trump supporting assholes who look like if smuggling endangered species was a power couple. They, they, they look like they'd be all judgy about people's <laughs> outfits in a hurricane shelter. Why the fuck are you friends with these people, Steve? <laughs> what the hell is wrong with you? They got you? a good board game collection. You must know be. It. Must be. All Sweet right. camo, though. I can't see. Oh, there you are in the hurricane shelter. <laughs> Cool. All right. So next up, we've got a round of special requests. Eli, this one is for you. Catherine would like a roast of the Gilmore Girls. Oh, an opportunity I will never pass up. Gilmore Girls is if all the girls who called themselves hilarious on Tinder got together to transcribe the most boring conversations they've ever had in an elevator. How dare you? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> People do like coffee. They do. This is such a bad show. They managed to waste Melissa McCarthy, an yeah, action movie co-starring Jason Statham, did not manage to waste Melissa McCarthy. <laughs> yes. But the Gilmore Girls did it for 155 seasons. <laughs> <laughs> and then a new season and there's a remake. 70 there's years a new later. One. Yes. There's a whole, it's a, you got to check it out. Did you love Gilmore Girls? What if they were less attractive and falling apart? Well, wish granted. Poof. <laughs> All right. Next up, Noah, I hate got Gilmore one for Girls you. So much. So you just passed your one year anniversary of not smoking. Yes, I did. So give us a roast of what you'll miss after quitting for Matthew. Right, right, because he said this in before I had quit. Yeah, okay, that would be the great outdoors, Heath. 
Like, seriously, you tack huh. this whole pandemic shit on top of quitting smoking, and I've seen the fucking sun in 2020 about as much as your average mogwai. <laughs> God, I also I also miss owing perfect strangers excuses for my personal failings. That was nice. All right, he's So fun. <laughs> Rui would like a uh, roast of New Zealand politician Don Brash. Ugh, gross. Okay, yeah. Don Brash is the Milton Friedman of... Of whatever. It doesn't matter how you end that. No. He's like Milton Friedman of something. Doesn't fucking matter. And besides understanding economics about as well as a 17-year-old jerking off to Atlas Shrugged, he spent most of his political career giving speeches about how the indigenous Maori people are the real bigots if you think about it. You know, they, they got all their land stolen and the only people they want to take it back from are white people. And huh. that is racist. <laughs> if he was American, he'd be explaining how the Cleveland baseball team got persecuted out of their name by big <laughs> Indian <the> conspiracy. <laughs> and Aggressive we actually brother. have a photo here of Don Brash at age 73 with his shirt all the way unbuttoned. It's gross that he took on purpose to promote his book. It's awful. He looks like the Pepperidge Farm guy started an OnlyFans. It's <laughs> terrifying. Oh, the things that Pepperidge Farm wishes it could forget. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So the next one is for all of us. Autumn would like us to take a crack at her mom and dad, Mary Beth and Kenneth. Cool. Nice. Okay. We got another picture here. So everyone's assistant principal apparently married everyone's lunch lady. That's fun. <laughs> They look like a Hallmark movie about the brave owners of a hetero-only cake shop. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what they look like is Mary, Beth, and Kenneth, right? Like, if they weren't assholes, they would clearly just be Mary and Ken or Beth and Kenny or something. But no, they're Mary, <laughs> Beth, and Kenneth. And they also wouldn't be abusive, science-denying, Trump-loving bigots who have doubtless screamed themselves hoarse about a coupon at some point in the last eight months if they weren't assholes, too. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what you pay for. Okay, but on the plus side, Autumn's parents, in every picture she sent us of them, look like they just realized what horrible douches they are. <laughs> like, like the photographer gave them a 25-minute presentation on being abusive assholes and then said, geez. Mm -hmm. But Autumn, there's good news. If there ever were people to ignore COVID restrictions, it's your parents, Autumn. So, you know, fingers <laughs> crossed. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'll tell you what, that felt good. Uh, let's do another round. Eli, this one is definitely for you because it's an internet person I don't care about. Stephen would like you to roast Theodore Beale, a.k.a. Vox Day. Oh, excellent. Vox Day always looks like he's saying, that depends on what your definition of farted in this elevator is. <laughs> this is a guy who was too racist and sexist for the science fiction community. Wow. Whoa. Space nerds, yeah. Space nerds put down their 950th issue of Spaceman Spiff fucks a blue lady and they were like, that guy's an asshole. He's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> respect to women. <laughs> All right, Noah, only fair that I return the favor here with someone I've never heard of. Alan would like you to roast Nev Arden Gayford. Ardern, yeah, that's the J Jacinda Ardern's kid. And Alan gave me the choice, actually, of roasting either the baby or her mom. And since I cut my own tongue out before I spoke ill of Jacinda Ardern. I guess the baby can go fuck herself. Hey, Nev, <laughs> it's what's up with all these pretentious fucking hats, you asshole. Oh, but I'm a little baby. I need a hat because I lose heat too quickly off my head and I don't have hair. Does it have to be a knitted pink bonnet? No. Does it go with anything else you're wearing? Get your shit together, baby. You're representing a nation here. Exactly. All right, Heath. <laughs> It's so mean to me. <laughs> Holly would like you to roast their rat, Toff. Yeah, so Toff is a patchwork hairless rat. What? And uh, it's kind of convenient when you can roast something just by naming the species they are. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. They look like those words. It's right on the nose. <laughs> patchwork hairless rat. Toff looks like Dinesh D'Souza trying to grow a beard in Chernobyl. <laughs> it's brutal. All right, awesome. Oh, you know what that means, or don't, because it doesn't normally, we don't usually intro this with a buzzer, but that means it's time for another spightening round. The category is family. We got a bunch of people who'd like to keep their insults within the family tree here. So our theme is family feud. I want you to insult these first roasties by telling me the answer they gave on family feud that lost their family the game. Eli, you're up first. Sarah's Aunt Carol. 
Oh, all right. Well, Carol was asked what people answered when asked about something orange, and she answered teeth. <laughs> yeah. Though, to be fair, if those hundred people had seen her, I think she would have swept the board. That said, based on the email Sarah sent, she also would have failed the question, what is a gun? <laughs> and the part where Steve Harvey asks your name. Wow. Interesting. Wow. <laughs> it's better with Steve Harvey than Ray Combs in that joke. Yep. Cool. Yeah. All right, Noah. Tell us what Brandon's aunt Angela did to get her kicked off the feud. Oh, well, he didn't give us much to work with, but based entirely on her photo, I'm going to say the category was things you eat when you're nervous. And her answer was, you're still beating heart, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> and he, this one uh, should be easy. Sarah would like a roast of her terrible brother, Casey. So what did he get wrong on the feud? Wow. Okay, this is rough. Sarah listed just so many horrible things about her brother, Casey. She sent a spreadsheet as an attachment. His <laughs> egregious flaws are sortable. <laughs> and uh, on Family Feud, they asked Casey to name one single positive quality in a human being. And before he could answer, Steve Harvey jumped in and said, being you, you obnoxiously perfect asshole. You're selfless, <laughs> loving, caring, and a wonderful father and a wonderful brother. This was actually a reverse roast. Boom. Nailed it. There was no spreadsheet. That was a lie. Sarah loves you so much that she donated to charity just for this reverse roast and somehow got me, Steve Harvey, to be part of it. <laughs> Honey roast in your face. <laughs> well done. There's a request that we like build it up to be a, a real roast and then switch it at the last second. Honey roast. All right. Well, that's all right. Nice. Didn't Pulled see the rug. it coming, Casey. Pulled the rug out from that asshole. Good father. Fuck you. Reverse asshole. I like how based on the structure of that, he had to claim to be Steve Harvey for that bit. I didn't work. know what to do. I felt. Yeah, I didn't. It's weird. It's weird. It's Channel, like, I weird. I don't know what. You didn't have to do the says. makeup. All right. So you let's stay not. in the family here. We're going to keep it seasonal, though. For this following spiting round, I want you to tell me what the roastie got for Christmas. I'm going to go first with Raymond's grandmother, Gloriana. And based on the description of that heinous bitch, my first guess is the host still beating heart from before. <laughs> but so I'm not accused of Chuck tingling that joke uh, and, and given everything <laughs> that Raymond had to say about her. Let's hope it was COVID. <laughs> <laughs> and Eli, as our resident baby expert, tell us what Daniel's grandson, Alexander, got for Christmas. Jesus, I hope it was some fucking teeth. What is this kid, 40 and still no teeth? Look, Alexander, bring it in, kid. The all gums look is adorable for like a year, but then you look like you're aiming for the world's youngest faces of meth poster. Grow some fucking teeth, kid. Teeth. All right, and Heath, what was under Samantha's husband's cousin Karen's tree this year? Okay, well, hopefully Karen got the letter E. For Christmas. Yeah. Because right now she spells it with a fucking I. <laughs> She's literally the Karen of Karens. But I'm guessing that letter E didn't happen. She uh she probably got an advent calendar of expired coupons. That's my guess. <laughs> and Noah, what did Abraham's siblings Nina and Sarah get in their stocking? Uh, well, they're atheists that grew up in an Orthodox Jewish family, so probably not a lot. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to go with melanin injections so they can go outdoors without an umbrella. Jesus, the glare on this picture is uncomfortable, people. <laughs> I think they were in Agent Emmis. I'm pretty sure <laughs> they're in the back. Okay, Keith, special challenge for you. Got it. Kate would like a roast of her stepbrother, Matthew. So I ask you, what is the Christmas-themed incest porn starring Matthew <laughs> called. All right. So Matthew is a CrossFit trainer and we actually have his official CrossFit employee photograph. And he very clearly just finished masturbating while standing in front of a mirror, popping his pecs <laughs> up and down because he always looks like he was just doing that. So the uh, Christmas themed incest porn is definitely fuck yourself a merry little Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe Oedipus Flex. Oh, nice. Yeah, there All it right. is. That's That's fantastic. fantastic. All right. Finally, Eli, in this spiting round, what did F. Raymond's sister Monica get for Christmas? Ooh, all right. Well, Monica is an anti-vaxxer, Trump supporter, climate change denier who homeschools her kids. So, I mean, she could get COVID, but Noah already said that one. Noah already said that one. So if I have to choose something to get her, I'm going to go with an eighth grade science textbook. You know, just a really spooker. Yeah, right, spooker. right. More more than COVID would actually, I think. 
for sure. All right. Well done all around. All right. So let's wrap up once again with a few of our high rollers. Obviously, we appreciate everybody who donates to our big fundraiser, but we appreciate the people who make big donations way more. And we're going to prove that by insulting these last few people way better. So we're going to start off with a special request for Heath. Sam would like you to roast the sick bastards that keep making you roast dogs. Fuck all of you. Hey, people <laughs> ask for a roast of a dog. You're everything that's wrong with humanity. You're the people who try to do comedy during a wedding toast. You're you're the people who get the fillet of fish at McDonald's. You're <laughs> you're Republicans. Okay. You know how, okay. you, know how you have those, those doubts about yourself. Everybody has them. You worry that you know, people don't like you. Your friends don't like you as much as you think. But then you think to yourself, nah, no, nah, I'm just being uh, I'm just being paranoid. You're not. You're <laughs> not paranoid. You are high maintenance. You do smell bad. Your face is shaped wrong. <laughs> You're Ben Shapiro and society is his wife's desiccated, gravelly, dusty <laughs> vagina. Tumbleweeds rolling through. Everybody hates you. Okay. Yeah. No, everybody not does. paranoid. Hey, you are. Right, so next we up, get mauled by a dog. <laughs> all right. So next up, Jeremiah got a gift for all of us when he asked us to roast the authors of the conceptual penis hoax and their own demise at the same time. Peter Bogosian and James Lindsay. Oh, how the nobodies have fallen. Like, mm. honestly, is there a better roast for these two than going back in time and telling them that they'd be clinging to the edge of atheism? In a few years, guests on the blaze and being uh, retweeted by Donald Trump, uh, that their companies would be founded and owned by right wing Christians. And to maintain their piddling, pathetic funding on Patreon, they'd have to court election fraud conspiracy theories that are too insultingly dumb for even them to believe. Again, just no better roast than for these assholes to have to live the lives they're forced to live every single day. Yeah, I mean, like, every detail I include in the roast is a sad admission that I know who they are. I mean, like, Pete wrote that one book that was pretty good back in the day, and and James also wrote a book, I think. And <laughs> he, 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 he tried to get interviewed on the show about it, and I was just like, dude, I mean, I'll argue with you about it. <laughs> and then, so, but then they became a live-action Twitter fight that never ends trying to wrap enough $5 words around, I know you are, but what am I, to keep convincing themselves that they're the real intellectuals during their fucking circle jerks. Okay, who the fuck are Dave Lindy and Parker Begolian? <laughs> <laughs> what? Nailed it. All right. And uh, how about one for Doug? He would like a roast of him. Okay. So Doug actually asked for Lucinda to roast him. So uh, we were thinking, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Lucinda loves roasting people. Just not you no. personally. Mm -hmm. She said you're not worth her time. And then she got mad that she spent time saying you're not worth her time. <laughs> And then she needed to cheer herself up, so she visited her dad in the hospital. Oh, that was Jesus fun. Christ, <laughs> then we thought about getting Cecil to roast you, but he didn't like how you looked like his Funko Pop. So, <laughs> yeah, you got stuck with me. And, uh, no. <laughs> Pass. Okay, so... Doug wrote us this lovely, genuine note about how much the show is meant to him. However, he wrote all that after he called himself a professional improv actor and sent <laughs> yes. us his picture. So I went blind. I couldn't see anything <laughs> else he wrote for us. <laughs> because, Doug, you look like you yes and airport security every time they stop you for a random check. <laughs> you look like when you ask for a profession and a location, it's to feed and house your family, not for improv. <laughs> Well, no, way. it's even worse. He also called himself a professional improv director, which seems like a job That's somebody real. made up as a bad punchline. <laughs> you direct people who are making shit up as they go along. <laughs> what are you directing them to do? <laughs> hey, guys, go out there and field coach. Yeah, run fast it up Got as it. they Thanks. go along. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, here's hoping that works out for you, because what the fuck industry would you turn to when I did essentially nothing as a decade's worth of your resume? I mean, other. I mean, now that the Trump administration is wrapping up, where would she go? Anyway, right. yeah. <laughs> so, okay, let's see. We've also got a request for Jordan's brother Nate, who, according to this note, thinks he looks like Jason Statham, which leads to the obvious question of why is 
Is he a blind person? Does he have some <laughs> Nothing like weird vampire condition where it like it comes to like when it comes to his reflection, and then he's only heard himself described by people who are too nice to be honest? Does he think that <laughs> looks like Jason Statham just means bald? Right? It would it would be no stranger if you told me Lucinda thought she looked like Jason Statham. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> also, apparently he sucks at skateboarding. Which is so beautifully obvious in this picture Jordan mm -hmm. sent us. Okay, mm -hmm. so <laughs> Nate is very clearly in the middle of fucking up some very basic skateboard thing. Oh, here's how basic. Yeah. An ollie. It's an right? ollie. He's, yep. he, he's standing on the tail of the board, so it looks like he's about to do an <laughs> ollie, but he very clearly isn't because there's no blur. <laughs> no, he is not. He is about to fall down to the earth. Okay, but the best part of this photo is that there is a disappointed eight-year-old, the appropriate age to be on a skateboard, okay. standing behind him, ages. waiting for him to stop doing whatever he's doing. <laughs> it's glorious. <laughs> it is glorious, this eight-year-old's facial expression. Yeah, it just looks like, it's just like, Uncle Nate, I thought you was going to do a trick. You're just going to, you're, you're faking Are it, you huh? done, <laughs> okay. you done with the ramp? Can I have the ramp now? <laughs> Except there's no ramp. There's right, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> He's doing an ollie onto nothing, mm -hmm. over nothing. And like Noah said, he obviously couldn't do an actual ollie for real. So he's doing a fake ollie onto just more flat ground. Yeah. <laughs> but nothing. He looks like Jason Statham in the same way this photo looks like a scene from a Fast and Furious movie. <laughs> and if you look closely at the kid in the background, he's sending us an email that says, my dad is a grown man in cargo shorts. Please send the charity donation back. We have to pay <laughs> <laughs> And last but certainly not least, Sean would like us to roast Dennis Muhlenberg, now former CEO of Boeing. Oh, yeah. No, the guy who's known for quotes like, I'm sure it was the pilot's fault. What's this Boeing 737 Max of which you speak? And <laughs> I'm some other guy. Dennis Muhlenberg doesn't have glasses, a nose this wide, or a little toothbrush mustache. But no, uh, in his defense, Dennis is from Iowa. So from an Iowan, the prospect of dying in a fiery plane crash isn't as bad as it would be for most. So I can see why he understated this at first. Yeah. And on the plus <laughs> side, who'd have thought you'd end up naming your company after the sound your aircraft make after they slam into the ground halfway through takeoff. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. And just for context, you were in charge of a company that was less ethical than Lockheed Martin <laughs> while you were there. Yeah. At least Lockheed freely admits that all their stuff is for killing people. <laughs> yeah, just be honest. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Iron Man was walking out of his company looking at you guys going, well, at least I didn't know that shit. <laughs> all right. Well, as much as I'd love to say that that did the trick, there are still plenty more roasts to go. So if you haven't heard yours yet, that's why we didn't think we'd have to wait this long either, but we're getting there. We promise. Before we draw the shades on this one, I wanted to let you know that if you're stuck at home for New Year's, you can spend a little of it with me if you want. Our friends from Thank God I'm Atheist and How To Heretic are doing a New Year's live stream. I'm going to be on for half an hour leading up to midnight Eastern time. So if you want in, be sure to check our Facebook page or follow at PIATPod on Twitter for links to the stream as soon as we have them. Anyway, that's all the blast movie we've got for you tonight. But we'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptic Rat, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern time on Monday. An even newer episode of our sister show's hot friend, God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday. And an even newer episode of our half sister show, Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I'd suck in a bad way if I neglected to thank Heath Enright for helping keep me sane through 2020. I need to thank Eli Bosnick for somehow making this shit work all year despite a new baby showing up halfway through. I want to thank the lovely and talented Lucinda Illusions for making the best out of the worst of fucking years. I also want to thank everybody else who helped us this year, including but not limited to Anna Bosnick, Don Ford, Voice of Fantasy and Adventure, Tom and Cecil, Andrew Torres, Tim Robertson, Morgan Clark, Angelo Madrid of Madrid Tunes, all the wonderful guests who gave us some of their time this year, and everybody who sent in a Farnsworth quote, including, of course, Jay, who provided this week's Farnsworth quote and solved racism. Thank you, Jay. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's sexiest celebrants, Clinton, Crystal, Christina, Jay, Trevor, Trucking, Atheist, Demon, Benjamin, Austin, Jillian, and Scott. 
Clinton, Crystal, Christina, and Jay, whose IQs won't be higher than the year number for much longer. Trevor, trucking atheist, and Dima, who are so sexy they make Times Square's balls drop. And Benjamin, Austin, Jillian, and Scott, who are brighter than the dumpster fire that was 2020. Together, these 11 enticing infidels enhanced our incomes and ensured our incessant insults endure this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to give us money, but if you do, you can make a per-episode donation to Patreon.com slash atheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode. Or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingadius.com. And if you'd like to help, but your money is cursed and you can't risk passing it on, you can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, and following at PAATPOD on Twitter. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robson handles our social media. Our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingadius.com. All right. I was just about to stop my recording here, but then I remember we haven't recorded any of the stuff yet. <laughs> All right. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved.